Good morning, church. I have to uh, start off saying my heart has been broken. I am very sad at the uh, events that have happened this week. We had two. Clackamas Mall, right in our own backyard, and then the Sandy Hook Elementary School. <clears throat> the emails and the calls they poured in yesterday. And so I wanted to spend some time with the Lord and <clears throat> and uh, seek his wisdom on this. The common theme, and, and maybe some of you have this going on in your hearts right now, is <clears throat> how can a God of love let suffering like this come in? That's a tough question. There is so many, there's so many uh, aspects to that question that just can't, easily be thrown out there. But I want to give you some Bible this morning on this, briefly before we get into the message, because I think it's important. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, 1 Timothy chapter 3, looking at verse 16, the Bible says this, and by common confession, Great is the mystery of godliness. Amen. He who was revealed in the flesh was vindicated in the spirit, beheld by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. To comprehend with finite minds the infinite mind of God is a futile task. The mystery of godliness is deep, but is one that requires trust and faith. 2 Peter chapter 2, looking at verse 12. In dealing with the heinousness of what has taken place, how someone could even respond by showing up to his mother's house, pointing a gun in her face and then not stopping there but going off to a school killing 20 babies and 7 adults 2 Peter chapter 2 starting in verse 12 it says but these like unreasoning animals born as creatures of instinct to be captive and killed reviling where they have no knowledge, will in the destruction of those creatures also be destroyed, suffering wrongs as the wages of doing wrong. They counted a pleasure to revile in the daytime. Isn't that interesting that the crimes that we're seeing today, there is no hidden mask of darkness. It's in broad daylight. Like unreasoning animals, they go in and, and do this heinous act. They are stains and blemishes, reviling in their deceptions as they carouse you, having eyes full of adultery that they never cease from sin, enticing unstable souls, having a heart tainted in greed and accursed children. The mentality of sin in the world today is so heinous that you cannot wrap your hands around it. 2 Timothy chapter 3 is talking about this very issue that we're facing today. 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting in verse 1. But realize this, that in the last days difficult times will come. Notice the time parameter that is mentioned. In the last days difficult times will come. What are those difficult times? For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, 
unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding a, to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, and avoid such men as these. In the last days, we can expect to see this heinousness taking place. So the question is, why does it happen? Why does this suffering take place in the first place? It isn't fair. It isn't good. It isn't just. But my friends, I want us to remind, I want to remind you of something. When Jesus walked on this planet, he suffered. He suffered the cross. He suffered our sins. The disciples suffered when they delivered a message they proclaimed great news of salvation. It wasn't fair. They died the way they did, but they suffered. The people that fought during all the world wars and died and gave up their lives, they suffered. Families lost their members as in those wars. People during the Holocaust, they suffered. People suffered in 9-11. People who have fought and now have come back from Iraq and Afghanistan who have either passed away or coming back with missing members of their body have suffered. Maybe even mentally as they're seeing these images taking place, they have suffered. Suffering is something that is a result of sin and was never part of the plan and humanity's creation. My friends, it goes back to this point. Suffering has made its welcomed appearance as humanity has chosen sin. Christ suffered right there. Humanity suffered right there. Death entered at that point of time right there. You know, I often try to think of the other side of the story to this whole heinous act. We don't know because of the mysteries of godliness how much God did provide help for the entire school. We don't know how many tears that were shed that day in heaven and how much pain and suffering he was going through as he's looking at these families. You see, Satan is doing everything in his power that he can so that God will take and bend his own rules of free choice. Satan wants him to demonstrate, to say, see, what God says is true and just, he can't follow. He can't follow himself. And so he allows this pain and suffering to come in, realizing it's causing pain and suffering above as well. He's trying to bend and twist God at every point. So for me, it makes it pretty clear why God in the last days takes his priestly garbs off and puts his uniform of war on and comes from heaven on his white horse with a sound of saying, I'm coming to get you, my children. I'm not going to let you suffer anymore. I want to read that to you. Revelation chapter 19, starting in verse 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat upon it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and wages war. 
His eyes are a flame of fire, and upon his head are many diadems, and he has, uh, he has a name written upon him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. The Calvary has come. The day of reckoning has come. The day when sin and sorrow meet its match. Verse 15, and from his mouth comes a sharp sword so that with it he might smite the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has the name written King of Kings and Lord of Lord. And friends, then and only then after that moment in time takes place, Revelation chapter 21, verse 3 begins. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he shall dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be among them. And he shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there shall no longer be any death. There shall no longer be any mourning, mourning or crying or pain. For the first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the springs of the water of life without cost. He overcomes shall inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. As we face these times and we see these things taking place, Recognize this is not what God wanted. He suffers, he's in pain with you. If anything, friends, this should, this should fuel us to get this good news out into the entire world. To get from this planet to share the gospel of Jesus Christ because he is the answer to this sin dilemma. This is what we need. His desire to be with us is strong. And it's times like this where it makes, I think, it helps humanity to let them self-examine them, their situations to say, do I want to dwell with him as much as he wants to dwell with me? Jesus is the answer. I want to share one more text before I start off with prayer. Philippians chapter 6. <clears throat> My prayer is that this is your prayer for the message today. Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 9, or 19, excuse me. Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 19. The Bible says, and pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that in proclaiming it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. That is my prayer for this congregation. So let's pray. Gracious Father in heaven, King of kings and Lord of lords, our hearts have been turned upside down. As we have seen these tragic events happening throughout the world, 
one right in our backyard and one across the country. The families that are affected. Lord, I just pray for a special indwelling of the Holy Spirit to be in all of them. Lord Jesus, we are in your sanctuary, your dwelling place, opening up your word. You have heard from the word of Ephesians chapter 6, verse 19, and that is my prayer. That the message will bring honor and glory to your name. That, Lord, I will not get in the way of it. And that every ear and eye will be opened to what you have for them. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> have you ever been away from your loved ones for a while? And uh, are longing for that reunion to take place? You know, today it's getting a little bit better. When I was over in Korea, all we had was telephones. But now you can get on Skype and you can actually do face-to-face -face pictures, pictures of each other or see each other talking. But there's nothing like the physical touch. There's nothing like the, the time when you can see your children come running up to you and put your arms around you or your wife grabs a hold of you and just does that warm embrace. That's something that uh, is so desperately needed. There's a desire when that absence has taken place that just fuels that fire. It's funny. When I was younger, I could go off and do as many things as I wanted to and not really have any worries. I was really independent that way. But when I was married, <laughs> I had... That whole settled down spirit started to, to hit me, and then sure enough, my kids started entering the picture, and then I became like a homebody. And uh, I still remember, like it was yesterday, and it was crazy because I was gone for a year and, uh, over in Korea, but yesterday, or just like yesterday, uh, I was gone to evangelism school in Florida for six weeks away from my family. I swear that was like the longest six weeks I've ever had. And I would get on there and I would talk to him on the phone and I would look at, you know, look at Skype, but I just couldn't wait to see them again. I couldn't, I couldn't wait to, to grab a hold of them, give them a hug, let them know I love them, get the hug from my wife. There's just something about that, that desire to, to dwell with them, to abide with them to be with them. That really was a driving force. You know, in looking at this scenario, another way to look at it is these families who have lost these babies. You think they have a desire for maybe just one more day? Just one more day. That desire is so strong. It is such a beautiful and yet motivating force. I think it's really fitting that that desire, that picture of desire of dwelling with one another as well as the indwelling of Christ in us comes around this time of year. As the world celebrates the birth of Christ, we should look at that desire of Christ but on the opposite desiring his desire to abide and to dwell with us. He's provided so many aspects to that. We're going to focus on the foundational block of that today. But we don't have to go far. Look at what it says here in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. The Bible says, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Which, tra which translated means God with us. Even his name in and of itself is des expressing desire to be with us. This desiring can be compared to that father and that mother's desire to be with their children, but even more so as a creator to his created. 
something so much bigger. I want us to uh, examine the dwelling then that we find this desire to dwell within the Old Testament. Because the New Testament goes into that and talks a lot about this, this aspect of dwelling, this aspect of abiding. I want to go back to the Old Testament. I want us to look at what this whole concept of dwelling is. And I think we can even find another picture. Something that has been painted even before, actually at the foundations of creation. We go back to Exodus chapter 25, looking at verse 8. The Bible says this, And let them construct a sanctuary for me. For what purpose? That I may dwell among them. Two points that I want us to pull from this passage. The first point is, is that the sanctuary was a literal structure. It was also and is also a literary structure now. You'll see this. It was the place where we find God's throne room. This type of sanctuary is also, and when you look at it through the Hebrew context of Exodus chapter 25, it actually talks of the sanctuary as a home. It, you can kind of compare that to John chapter 14. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. It's the same house that we're talking about. Build me a sanctuary. For what purpose? So that I can abide with them. I can dwell with them. It is God's desire to be with his creation. From the foundations of the earth, he wanted to be with his creation. He doesn't have a deist mindset of saying, well, I formed them, I threw them out there in a planet somewhere, and they're on their own. He wants to be part of our lives. He wants to be engaged in every aspect. He wants to experience every bit of pain and sorrow you may be going through, but as well as celebrate the joy and celebration of life that he can give you as well. He wants to abide with you. That word dwell comes from the Hebrew word shakan, which means to actually settle down. You know, when you find your home and, and it's this nice cozy house and you just settle down and you get real comfortable in it. Maybe you look at it from a church perspective. You're settling on down into your church. This becomes your family. It's the same principle that we see from the word shakan. To dwell with. If this dwelling and the sanctuary are so important, then I bet the Bible can point us to going back even before the mosaic sanctuary was constructed and find the same picture of the sanctuary there. And sure enough, it does. We're going to go back and look at creation itself. Under this theme of sanctuary, with the concept of wanting to dwell with us. The first point that we're going to look at is in the actual Garden of Eden itself. Look at where the positioning of the Garden of Eden is. We're going to parallel these uh, as we go through. First off, the Garden. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 8, the Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he formed it. Now in the garden, the entry point of the garden was facing what direction? The east. In the sanctuary, on the other hand, we have this in Exodus chapter 36. Whoops, let me get over here. We're comparing them. Exodus chapter 36 and for the rear of the or tabernacle, to the west, he made six boards. Now, it, this is, I'm pulling one text out of the context of, of uh, Ezekiel 36, 20 through 30 as the construction of the temple. But I want us to focus on the first point of that, which was the rear of the temple was facing what direction? 
Okay, so what does that mean then the front of the er, sanctuary was facing? East. To the east. So the garden was facing, the entrance of the garden was facing to the east. The tabernacle was facing to the east. Okay? So that was the rear of the tabernacle. So the face of the tabernacle was to the east. There's another one. In Ezekiel, doing the same comparison again to Genesis chapter 2 verse 8. It is facing the east. Look at what it says here. Then he brought me back to the door of the house, and behold, water was flowing from under the threshold of the house toward the east. Door, water coming forth. We're going to get into that a little bit more. Facing the east. Okay. For the house faced east. And the water was flowing down from under and from the right side of the house and from south of the altar. So we have the positioning of the Garden of Eden in the same type of position that we find with the sanctuary. They both had their entry points to the east. Look at else. Look at what else happens here. God plants the Garden of Eden. Look at the words that are used here. In Genesis chapter 2, and the Lord God planted, the Hebrew word there is nata, a garden toward the east in Eden. And there he placed the man whom he had formed. We'll compare that to Exodus chapter 15, verse 17. Thou wilt bring, or thou wilt bring them and plant, the same word nata, them in the mountain of thine inheritance, the place, O Lord, which thou hast made for thy dwelling, the sanctuary, O Lord, which thy hands have established. God planted the sanctuary in the Garden of Eden. God planted the sanctuary for the people his inheritance to partake of. Look at this one. We'll do the same comparison. God plants the Garden of Eden with Genesis 2.8 and 1 Chronicles 17.9. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant, nata, plant them that they may dwell in their own place and be moved no more. Neither shall the wicked waste them any more as formerly. So the context of this this verse is dealing with you know, David's desire to build God a sanctuary. He wanted to. He was looking back at his fortress. He was looking back at his house and he says, listen, I'm living in a house of cedar and, and the Lord's, the, the Ark of the Covenant is in a tent. His desire for, for making God's sanctuary and that was the response that he received. So the planting of the sanctuary in the garden was the same type of planting God uses when he talks about the Mosaic sanctuary. Here's another interesting concept, the tree of life. The tree of life in the garden of Genesis 2.9 says this, And out of the ground the Lord God caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight, for, uh, to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. We compare that then to the sanctuary. In the sanctuary, the presence of God was in the midst of his people. Exodus 25, 8, we go back to that foundation. Build them a sanctuary, or construct a sanctuary for me that I may dwell among them. The Hebrew word is tevek which means in the midst of them. God wanted to be part of them, right smack dab in the middle of them. When you look at how the sanctuary was constructed and you see those pictures, you have this tent, and a lot of those pictures have this tent, and then it has this, either a big fiery uh, pillar of fire up above the tent or a cloud above the tent, and then all around the sanctuary were these little tents. He was in the midst of of the children of Israel. The tree of life, the life giver. God's desire to dwell 
with humanity was founded even before the Mosaic sanctuary was constructed. It was found in heaven and it was found in Eden. Look at the rivers of Eden. In the garden in Genesis 2, 7, it says, Now a river flowed from out of Eden to the water of the ground, and from there it divided and became four rivers. We compare that then to the sanctuary in heaven. In Ezekiel 47, verse 12, And by the rivers on its bank, on one side and on the other will grow all kinds of trees for food. Their leaves will not wither. Their fruit will not fail. They will bear every month because their water flows from the sanctuary. And their fruit will be for food and their leaves for healing. In Ezekiel 47, 1 through 12, it's talking specifically about the healing effects of the river of life. And how that water nourishes and brings forth life everlasting. And how it's coming from the throne room of God. Look at this one, how you compare this together with it. We're talking the same river. And he showed me a river of water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and from the Lamb. In the midst of its street, and on either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing twelve kinds of fruit, yielding fruit every month. And the leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nations. Rivers were planted in the Garden of Eden. Rivers, just a type of the river of life that throw, uh, flows from the throne room of God. This concept of the sanctuary is foundational to life in dwelling with Christ. And it's such a powerful point. Look at this. The three spheres of space. Now, I, I got this quote actually from Angel Rodriguez on his book, the Sanctuary Theology in the Book of Exodus, out of uh, Andrew University's printing press. This one is fascinating because when you see how he formed creation and the comparison between the two, let me read. On earth, after creation, there were three spheres of space and ascending degrees of holiness are set apart for special use. The earth the garden, and the midst of the garden. These three spheres are also seen as Sinai, the camp, the place where the 70 elders could go on the mountain, and the immediate presence of God where only Moses could go. They are repeated in the sanctuary system, the court, the holy place, and the most holy place, which is found in the, in the depths of the sanctuary. Everything God does is intentional. And it all centers on his desire to dwell with us and abide with us. From the foundations of creation, he has set this up because he values human life. He values our relationship with him. So he creates this so that this can take place. Look at the creation of the world paralleling the Mosaic Sanctuary. The creation of the world took six days, each introduced by the clause, and God said, followed by the seventh day Sabbath. So did God's instructions to Moses regarding the building of the sanctuary in Exodus chapters 25 through 31. These chapters are divided into six sections introduced by the phrase, the Lord said to Moses, followed by concluding the seventh section dealing with the Sabbath. Everything is centered around his dwelling with us. I want us to get that point and drive it home. Because we're going to see later on why that is so important for us to understand. He wants to be with us. He desires to be with us. Look at the work of Eden. Look at this. When we go back to the Garden of Eden, uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, the Bible says, The Lord 
Then the Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate and keep it. Some versions say to till it and keep it. Now it's really interesting because when you look at that word to till or to cultivate, the word is actually used in Hebrew as avad or aved, which means to serve, to serve the ground and to keep it. When you parallel that with Numbers, chapter 3, looking at the sanctuary structure, you find something very similar. And they shall perform the duties for him and for the whole congregation before the tent of meeting to do the service avad of the tabernacle. They shall also keep all the furnishings of the tent of meeting along with the duties of the sons of Israel to do the service of the tabernacle. The sanctuary service. Adam and Eve were asked to tend, to serve the sanctuary, the Eden sanctuary, and to keep it. Just as the Levites were asked to serve and to keep the Mosaic sanctuary in order. The sanctuary is a deep, powerful, foundational building block upon everything that we know of Jesus Christ. Let's look at the sanctuary at the post-fall. So the post-fall depiction of the Garden of Eden. After Adam and Eve are expelled in their sinful state, they are no longer able to meet Jesus face to face in the garden. What happened when the sinner was able to, uh, when the sinner in the, in the Mosaic sanctuary, when they sinned, could they just walk into the Holy of Holies? They were no longer able to meet, to walk in the coolness of the day with Jesus in the sanctuary of Eden. But instead, we're now expelled outside because of the sin. Look at this. To the eastern entrance of the garden, guarded by cherubim with fl flaming swords, Adam and Eve and their children came to worship God, built their altars, brought their sacrifices. Here the Shekinah glory was manifested as God came down to hold communion with them, patriarchs and prophets. At the foundation, right at its gate, they no longer could go inside. Because they have chosen sin, they have lost the responsibility to be able to keep and serve in the sanctuary. Friends, the sanctuary is not some mystical or mysterious theological concept, but rather our building blocks of our faith. This faith is centered on the indwelling of Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit in our hearts because he's desiring a relationship with us. That is one of the greatest aspects. When you look at the Sabbath in regards to the sanctuary, why do we have the Sabbath? To spend time and one-on-one -on -one time with our Creator God and worship, establishing our relationships with Him. He builds a sanctuary in order for Him and us to be able to commune together. His desire to be with us is so tremendous that he was able to, or willing to send his son. By the name of Emmanuel, God with us because he loves us and is desiring to be with us. You can start to understand then why the devil is attacking the very foundations of the sanctuary. Because at its core, it is talking about relationships, and the devil doesn't want you to have one with Jesus. And so he's going to take and flip around and change it and twist it and do whatever he possibly can to crumble that cornerstone of our faith, which is the sanctuary message. Look at this text. 
Daniel 8, 9 and 10, it says, And out of one of them came forth a rather small horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the beautiful land. And it grew up to the host of heaven, and caused some of the host of, and the, some of the stars to fall to the earth, and, to, and it trampled them down. And this is the key. It even magnified it itself to be equal with the commander of the host. Friends, who's the commander of the host? God, Jesus, he is the commander of the host. It sounds kind of like Satan's understanding in Ezekiel chapter 28. He wanted to be like the most high, right? So look at this, this little horn power. He says, he, wanted, he even magnified itself to be equal with the commander of the host, and it removed the regular sacrifice from him, and the place of his sanctuary was thrown down. The core of what this power did was wanting to ruin your relationship with Jesus. He wanted to take the foundational building blocks of our faith and crush it so that you didn't have one-on-one -on -one time with him. He goes on. <clears throat> Verse 12, And on account of transgression, the host will be given over to the, to the horn along with the regular sacrifice, and it will fling truth to the ground and perform its will and prosper. You can see how the devil, looking at from the foundations of earth, looking at from the sanctuary of Eden, to the Mosaic sanctuary that we find in the wilderness, to the heavenly sanctuary we find in heaven, Satan's uttermost desire is to flip it upside down and to destroy it. Because he realizes if God's children understand this, the whole plan of salvation is in it. Jesus is at its core. They will walk away as empowered people of Christ through the, through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and then his time will truly be cut short. And he's trying to be as vicious with this as possible. Finishing this section up here. In verse 13 it says, Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that particular one who was speaking, How long will this vision about the regular sacrifice apply? While the, tra while the transgression causes horror so as to allow both the holy and the most holy to be trampled. Isn't that interesting? Verse 14, And he said to me, For 2,300 days, then the holy place will be properly restored. The devil is after this. I have looked at this. I have prayed over this. Friends, it is time for us to get back into being sanctuary people again. We haven't heard a lot of sanctuary talk. We need to understand what the sanctuary has for our lives we need to understand what the implications of each and every aspect of the ministry of the sanctuary has in our lives because it all points to Jesus and his desire to indwell in us, to have a relationship with us. And if that is taken away, if that is removed, then what do you have? But an empty, shallow gospel that has no power There's nothing. It also leaves us hopeless and confused. Without a sanctuary, friends, it's, you can even say this. Without a sanctuary, there's no need for a cross. There's no need for a cross, there's no need for Jesus. If there's no need for Jesus... There's no need of law. If there's no need of a law, then there's no need of sin. You can do whatever you want to do. Because everything is centered upon the sacrificial system, which is found in the sanctuary.
We need Jesus so desperately much to show us his ministry. You, you, you realize that when you get into the sanctuary readings and the sanctuary uh, understanding of the Old Testament and then you look back into the New Testament, you look in the Hebrews and you start exploring that heavenly sanctuary that you see there, you will find a better understanding of the Gospels of Jesus. You will start to understand then why Jesus was doing what he was doing. You will start to understand with a fuller conscience to be able to say, yes, all these different theological points of view. I, I like bringing this one up. It's very popular. The once saved, always saved. Right? I don't have to go very far to prove this wrong. And it's not about proving it wrong, but it's just about recognizing that it's error. You go to the sanctuary. Bring them to the sanctuary. When you come to the sanctuary, you enter into the outer court. In the outer court, there was a burnt, uh, the altar of burnt offering, and you had the laver. Okay? So when a sinner would come in, they would take a lamb, they would go up to the altar of burnt offering. The, the, the priest at that time would hand them a knife. The sinner would cut the lamb's throat, hold the lamb in place while the priest collected the blood of the lamb. Barbaric. Hard. Right? Sin is disgusting. And it's filthy. And it's horrible. Sin takes life. We've witnessed that already twice this last week. The lamb is representing Jesus Christ. John 1.29, Behold the lamb of God which takes away the sins of the world. So the sinner comes in, offers the lamb, the blood is sprinkled on there, and the, the sinner then is justified. He has been proclaimed as being right in the sight of God. His sin has been taken from him. Okay? Now let's look at that in a practical application. If we see then and we come in and we meet Jesus and we say, Jesus, you're my Savior, I am a sinner. I come to the cross. I come to the altar of burnt offering. I accept the life of Jesus as my atoning sacrifice at the cross, at the altar of burnt offering. He now justifies me. But see, I'm not done yet. I have the rest of the sanctuary to keep walking through. I didn't stop at the altar of burnt offering. I got to keep on going. What's the next step? You come to the laver. What is the laver representing? The living waters of Jesus Christ. When I accept Jesus as my Savior, I then go into the waters of baptism. And I come out clean. I come out in the next phase of my journey with Christ. And we keep going through the sanctuary, right? We had to keep moving. So then I enter the holy place. And here comes sanctification. That big theological term where God then begins to look at it and says, listen, you got this sin going on in your life. I really want it. I really want you to give that to me. And so we, we begin to start purging these sins through the holy place. And then we get into the last stage, the most holy place. It's the glorification place. This is a place when Christ himself descends with a loud voice and a trumpet blast from God, and we ascend into heaven. We're glorified. Our bodies are changed in an instant. That is the big picture of the sanctuary. You see, once saved, always saved doesn't work there. I don't need to walk through the sanctuary if I'm already saved. It doesn't work. You can start to see where the devil is attacking this. Why? Because it flips everything upside down. Friends, we need to be in the sanctuary. Every aspect of it. We look at the, we're going to look at the burnt offerings. We're going to look at the sin offerings. 
We're going to look at the trespass offerings. And let me tell you, those are pretty big. That is basically known and unknown sin. A trespass offering is known sin. We're going to explore what that means. We're going to start looking at the feasts and the festivals. What do those mean in regards to the sanctuary? How do those apply to Christ's life? What can we walk away? Because let me tell you, friends, it is relevant for our time. It is relevant. I have heard too many times the sanctuary is some mystical theological concept that doesn't have any real application for today's life. And it cripples me. It hurts me. It has everything to do with what and who we are. You take the sanctuary out, what are we? A Sabbatarian, shallow gospel preaching people. And that is not what God has asked Christians, followers of Christ to be. But to be established in Him. Because He's worth it. And He's desiring to dwell with us. As we go throughout the, this next new year together, we're going to spend some time with this. And my prayer is that we will walk away with an understanding of the sanctuary of Christ that will prepare us for his soon return. Because, friends, the earth is a pretty lousy place to be on right now. And his desire to be with us outweighs that. May our desire to be with him be just as strong. Let's pray. Father in heaven, <clears throat> Lord, as we have gone through and we studied this theme of the sanctuary from the foundations of creation through the Mosaic sanctuary into the heavenly, we recognize the importance that it's not some fleeting man-made doctrine that is out there to establish theological concepts, but one actually that is foundationally established on you. Lord Jesus, as we go home, as we hold our families, let us think of that indwelling as you want to hold us as well. Father, again, we're asking that you will please send the portion a large portion of your Holy Spirit to these families who have lost loved ones. We thank you and praise you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.